be a ranger is to sense the secret trust of upholding all that such a name means in this shrine of football. They must be true in their conception of what the Ibrox tradition seeks from them. No true ranger has ever failed in the tradition set him. Founded in 1873, Rangers Football Club is an institution steeped in a rich history. From the famous light blue shirt to the instantly recognisable red brick facade of the main stand, a club unique in the world of football. Lots of clubs have had success, but nobody's got the, the rich history. Nobody's had a consistently winning, nobody's had consistently great players, and nobody's had the consistency of huge gates. We've had all that, but also what we've got is a unique, a unique stadium. Uh, there are a lot of fantastic stadiums in this world, uh, but they've all been knocked down and built up again, and they're completely modern. What we've managed to do in this stadium, uh, which makes it unique, is marry the, the old with the new. So you come in the marble staircase and you see the red brick front, uh, but you come into the stadium, you sit in a state-of-the-art stadium. No other stadium in the world is like that. Throughout the decades, the club has been lucky enough to find itself served by some tremendous managers. Graham Souness and Walter Smith's nine-in-a-row era. Two trebles in the space of three seasons, thanks to Jock Wallace. William Wilton, the first manager, away back in 1899. But of all the famous names to take charge at Ibrox, perhaps none had the influence of William Struth appointed manager in 1920 after the tragic death of William Wilton. It was 34 years until he stepped down, having led Rangers through a period of unprecedented success, winning a total of 18 league titles, 10 Scottish Cups and 2 League Cups. Bill Struth was a trainer first and then a manager. He was a manager from 1920 to 1954 and he laid down a lot of the history, a lot of the traditions for the club and also laid the foundations for huge amount of success. A manager in these days wasn't like a manager now. A manager basically had total control of the club. Uh, and I mean, when this stadium got built, the new bit of the stadium which was built in 1928, Bill, Smith, uh, Bill Struth, who was uh, a stonemason to trade, I was hugely influential uh, with Archie Leach on the design of it and everything like that. So his role wasn't just on the playing side, it was the whole side of the club and he helped the club to grow and develop to what it is today. Finally, Bill Struth was to have a lasting tribute at Ibrox. It was decided a bust of the influential manager would proudly sit on the marble staircase just inside the front door of the stadium. For the creation of such a piece, sculptor Andy Scott's name stood out from all others. Well. Andy, to be honest, is one of the best sculptors in, uh, in Scotland. Uh, Andy is a Ranger supporter. He did the John Gregg statue, he did the Davy Cooper, he did Jim Baxter, and every one of them was uh, actually terrific. Glasgow-based artist started working on the bust at the end of March 2005. It was a chance to link up once again with the club he's always supported. It's, it's a great privilege for me um, uh, being involved with an institution like Rangers and, and uh, you know the, the club with all its history and its, uh, its heroes and uh, I think it's a tremendous thing that the club pays respect to it, to that heritage and, and obviously that reflects in the way that they treat the fans and, and all those other aspects that make the club what it is. A slow and intricate process, Andy Scott spends hour upon hour, day after day working the rough clay model as Mr Struth's features become ever clearer. More than three decades spent as Rangers manager, an Ibrox legend who's finally being remembered in appropriate style. An incredible thing to be captured in bronze for, for all time, you know. Um, I know from, from personal memory when, when John Gregg himself came up to see the statue that I did uh, using him as the figurehead for the club for the disaster memorial, I think it was, it was quite an emotive or emotional experience for, for both him and, and me as, as the sculptor and certainly it was the same when I did the statue of Jim Baxter, you know, it's an amazing thing to have something cast in bronze that's going to be there for a long, long time. Months of planning came before this stage and the process even now poses its own particular set of problems. Because he was with the club for so long, he, uh, he changes uh, quite dramatically from age to age and uh, the hard part of that for me is uh, 
translating that kind of longevity as, as a manager into a likeness that everybody will recognise and, and pays the man the, the credit that he's due. Made the first one that you can see over my shoulder in the distance there was uh, the first go at it and when uh, Sandy Jarden and uh, David Mason came up to see it, while well, they were delighted with the likeness as I was approaching, you know, get towards the finish, they were concerned that it would actually be too big for the location and ultimately they're the client and uh, it was intended to go on the half landing in the staircase inside the main entrance of Ibrox and it does get a lot of usage, especially on match days and it would be a terrible thing if it was to get in the way so we decided to scale it down and hence the uh, newer, smaller version you see over my, directly over my shoulder here. With that problem solved, it was on with the work. Just a week later, a real likeness to Mr Struth had already emerged. Scott using a variety of tools and techniques gathered from years in the trade. Oh, well, when you were here last and uh, I was working on it, it was very much in the early stages of roughing it out, blocking in the basic shape of the forehead, the nose, and just getting a general feel for it. And as you can see since then, I've uh, really tightened in the, the shape quite considerably. Get beginning to get the features in position. Um, one half of the face almost there, the other half I'm just beginning to pull it in and, and work in the sort of uh, the eyes and the, the cheekbones and the structure of the face. Uh, well I find it very tricky, different artists are skilled at different things. I, I know some who can rattle it off very very quickly and uh, you know then sometimes can take it too far and kind of lose it a wee bit. Um, I like to take a more studious approach to it and really take my time and delicately add on as you can see tiny little bits can make quite a difference to the, to the, uh, the impression of the, the likeness. Um, it's a tricky thing, you know, it's, it comes with practice and uh, I, I quite enjoy the challenge. I think we're getting there, um, but it's, it's probably got another, quite another few days to go on it yet to get it all tightened up. It's now some three weeks since work on Mr Struth began. The finishing touch is all that's left to add. The all-important minor details will bring more than a touch of realism to the finished piece. It's uh, been a series of uh, uh, progressive movements towards whittling down the features and getting them just so, looking at different photographs and trying to capture a, a medium between all those likenesses that were in the different photographs over the different years that they were taken. And I'm very happy with the way that he's come out. Um, a few tiny little minor uh, changes still to be made, but nothing uh, too noticeable. As Andy Scott prepared to say goodbye to the bust, stage one of the production process is complete. Next for Mr Struth, a journey to the heart of the Scottish borders and one of the country's foremost foundries for stage two. Our very success, gained you will agree with skill, will draw more people than ever to see it and that will benefit many other clubs than Rangers. Let others come after us. We welcome the chase. Eleven managers have now taken responsibility for guiding the light blues. Bill Struth's 34-year tenure is not only remarkable in its length, but also by the amount of trophy success generated. His legendary status entirely appropriate. You could say he was the greatest manager of all time. I'm sure supporters of other clubs would, uh, would argue with that, but uh, I think when you take into consideration the period of his tenure, the success uh, and his overall influence to the club, then you know it's very easy to understand why there's a good case for, for arguing for his status. Mr Struth was famously said to rule Ibrox with an iron fist inside a velvet glove. Firm but fair, players were made well aware of the consequences of stepping out of line, but rarely did. The maxims that he followed were only the best is good enough for Rangers and, uh, and the club is greater than the man. And although he was an icon in himself, and if there was anybody who was going to defy that maxim of the club is greater than the man, it would have been Struth. But, uh, but he set such high standards for this place. Uh, standards such as fine dress, people had to be well dressed at all times, not just when they came into the ground, but when they were out with the ground as well. Uh, Behaviour, players weren't allowed to smoke. He frowned upon drinking. Uh, he didn't like to hear them swearing. Again, because these were standards that he felt were important and befitting a Rangers player. Um, and he followed them quite religiously himself, so uh, just such an icon to, to the whole club. It's now more than half a century since Bill Struth left the manager's office for the final time, but the players of today certainly still feel his influence. I know for a fact that the players are aware of it because uh, they are issued with a, a rule book at the start of the season. Uh, and that rule book, I think it's the first rule, highlights the traditions of Bill Struth and the expectations of, of uh, him and of people who play with Rangers. 
and it's emphasised to them that the club is greater than the man, for example. And we, you know, we really do go great, go at great lengths to explain just how important it is that uh, that players do reach standards, not just in terms of the quality of their play, but also the quality of their behaviour. Nestled in the picturesque Tweed Valley, Peebles in the Scottish Borders is a million miles from the hustle and bustle of daily life at Ibrox. This quiet town in southeast Scotland is the next destination for the Struth bust. The finished clay model has been transported to the Beltane Studios, one of a dying breed, a traditional foundry specialising in bronze casting. Not that many people know how to do it. Uh, there isn't a, a massive demand for it either, to, to be truthful. Um, you know, you don't see a, a monument being put up every day of the week. So, uh, and it's quite an expensive process. Some people think that we start with a block of bronze and chip away at it until we get the finished article. Some people think we paint bronze onto things. Uh, you know, I, I can understand why most people don't know anything about the process because it's hardly ever seen, but it is a very time-consuming, intricate uh, process. The bust will spend the next few weeks here until finished. At the beginning of May, Beltane's staff get the process underway. Four coatings of silicon rubber are applied to the clay, the first stage of creating an exact replica of the original. We have to get an absolutely exact impression from the clay, and this is the best way to do it. When it as it goes on liquid, it, goes, it fills every core, as I say, and uh, we have to build up to, uh, to get a thickness uh, so that it won't just, you know, uh, it won't be too wobbly. Once fiberglass jackets have been added to support the rubber, the casing is split down the middle and the bust removed. Wax is painted inside the rubber skin to pick up every detail from Andy Scott's original model before the addition of a plaster core. When the jackets are removed and the rubber skin once again peeled away, an exact replica of the clay bust can be seen. It's a very time consuming uh, process, it's, it's also very skill intensive. Um, which is basically why um, bronze casting is, is expensive. It's not, it's not so much the cost of materials, it's, it's the time and effort that goes into it. You don't want anyone to see your work. As, I, you know, as a caster, you're basically trying to make a totally faithful copy of whatever you're given in the first place. You don't want your work to be seen. Soon the bust will be ready for the kiln, three days at temperatures of more than 1,000 degrees centigrade. Described as pound for pound, one of Bill Struth's best ever purchases, striker Billy Simpson joined the club in 1950. The Northern Irishman went on to score more than 150 goals in his nine years at Ibrox. He remembers his first meeting with Mr Struth as if it were yesterday. I we'll come up to Mr Struth's house at Copeland Road and uh, he was, uh, I was really an all nerves meeting, meeting such a a great man, Mr. Struth, you know. So uh, he uh, told me uh, what was wanted of the club when you when you signed for Rangers, what you had to do. You hadn't to do anything that would disgrace the club. I recall him as a very <coughs> imposing figure, very strict disciplinarian. Someone took a great pride in his dress and who expected his players to do the same thing, both on and off the field and uh, also emphasised that it was a privilege and a great honour to be a Rangers player. Never forget that. Well, he came here as a non-footballer. He was actually an athletics coach, and I think that played a big advantage. He was also a perfect gentleman. What he used to do, he was never a training. He might have been sitting up in the director's box watching us train, but before a game, he would just come in and say, enjoy your game, boys. Good luck. And that was it. No tactics. He said, wherever you go, uh, you're not to let the name of Rangers Football Club down. And uh, wh what I could always remember of him, too, he, he says, uh, do you like going to the films? I said, oh, yes, I like going to the films. He says, well, when you go to the films, you don't go to the cheapest you'll go to the dearest and it's the same in, no matter where you go and uh, I, th I, don't, I think I answered him I said but what if, I, what if I haven't enough money just for a bit of humour you know but he laughed he says you'll have enough money to go to the dearest seats don't worry about that you know 
he really lived Rangers. He was here no matter what time he came here. Bill's truth was in his office and I believe that on occasion he just slept here. Uh, I would say that uh, he knew exactly what he wanted and um, always it was to keep Rangers at the top. Uh, Billy Simpson who is with me today was ha having a glass of beer and he was coming out the blue room with it and he was told to take it back in. So that's the truth legend still there. I have been lucky. Lucky in those who were around me from the boardroom to the dressing room. In times of stress, their unstinted support, unbroken devotion to our club and calmness in adversity eased the task of making Rangers FC the premier club in this country. Back at the Beltane Studios, the original clay bust is no longer needed. The team are working with a plaster replica coated in a thin layer of wax. Before the molten bronze is added, the bust needs to spend three days hardening in the kiln. For this, it's invested, coated in a special type of plaster designed to withstand extreme heat. In there, the wax will burn out, leaving a narrow tract where the molten metal can be poured. Once out of the kiln and cooled off, the bust is wrapped in layers of hessian and more plaster, protection for the delicate structure. While that's being placed in a pit, bronze ingots are melted in the furnace at temperatures of more than 1200 degrees centigrade. Pouring the molten metal is certainly the most dangerous part of the process. I mean, when it's in its molten form, it's incredibly dangerous. If, you know, if it hit your leg, it would just go right through it and take your leg off. A day later, the bust is broken open. Weeks of hard work have gone before this stage. If the bronze hasn't cast properly, it's back to the drawing board for all concerned. It's always a nervous time when we're uh, removing the, the moulds from the plaster because you're never 100% sure of what you're going to get. Uh, obviously, more often than not, it's fine, but you do get the occasional mispour, so you might get a few holes or something. So, in this case, it uh, worked very well. Once most of the plaster has been removed, Mr Struth begins to emerge once again. A month and a half since Andy Scott began work on the clay original, the finished piece is now close. Well, the finished piece isn't far away from uh, that which you break out from the, the mould. You know, it's just a matter of removing the extraneous uh, bits, but you can see what you're going to end up with at that point. So it is an exciting part of the process. Over the coming days, Eivor and his team work the metal, returning both the texture and appearance of the bronze to as close to the original as possible. A variety of tools are required during the fettling process, a delicate operation where one slip of the hand could prove costly. With the bust tidied up, the experts at the Beltane Studios prepare to patinate the bronze. The surface is heated up and a unique mix of chemicals applied, changing its appearance almost instantly. Once the patination begins, you can really see the, the, the texture coming through in the whole piece and the surface texture and all the subtleties in it. And also, it gives bronze the, the luster, the natural looking luster that you see on all bronze pieces. Bronze is called the eternal metal since you know ancient times and as, as there's pieces still remaining from, from Greek, Byzantine, all these ages past. So with uh, care and attention, it oh, should last forever. All that remains now is a coating of wax and a quick polish, protection against the elements. Weeks of work which began in a Glasgow sculptor's studio, ending in a border's foundry. The Struth bust is finished. Hundreds of man-hours have been spent on the project. Techniques honed throughout the centuries have been used. After almost two months of work, what's the verdict? It's a particularly good piece actually. It's a really good cast and the finishing came together really well. And just the way that Andy's sculpted and everything, it, looks, it just looks stunning in bronze. It really comes to life once it comes to the finishing part of it. Opened on the 1st of January 1929, the new main stand at Ibrox surpassed anything else in Scotland at the time. It contained the manager's office, a room which was to become a second home to Mr Struth. In here he worked alongside private secretary Alison Dallas. As a youngster, her daughter Alison Muir spent many an hour within those four walls. Happy memories, because I used to sometimes do my homework here on a at night, you know. On this table? Uh -huh. no, well, I don't know if it's this one, but a <laughs> similar one anyway. Yeah. And uh, very happy memories, because Mr. Struth was quite a, a jovial person, you know, and uh, good fun, and uh, there was no problem 
I was taking him from the chair while I uh, did my homework here. I mean, he virtually lived here for a good part of his time, didn't he? Yes, he was, I he was did. so devoted to yes, the club. Yes, he was. Uh -huh. And then there was always fire watching duties too. So yeah. there was a couch through in the other room uh, and that he took his turn here. He yeah. lived across the road for yes, a long Copeland time, road. but mm -hmm. he, he would spend long hours here, wouldn't Oh, he? yes, yes. Uh -huh. Difficult to get him away from, from Ibrox. Is that right? Even when the players were training at night, he wanted to wait on him. Mr. Struth became close to the Dallas family, although he did his best to keep his personal and private life separate. His affection for the well-being of his players was clear, as forward Tori Gillick was to find out. Mr. Struth had seen Tori one day and he said, I believe you've got a girlfriend. Is this a serious thing? And Tori had said, yes it is. Have you bought her a ring? No, I haven't. So Mr. Struth says, well, go out and buy her a ring and I shall deduct the money from your wages each week until you've paid it off. So that's how Molly got a nice engagement ring. In 1950, Mr. Struth suffered gangrene in a toe. He was told the leg would have to be amputated just below the knee. Even that couldn't dampen his commitment to the club he loved. I don't know whether uh, what started off the, the thing with his toe, but it, it became gangrenous. And eventually he knew that the leg had to be amputated. And uh, he just made very little of it. They knew it had to happen. Uh, when, when did that happen? How long before he died? Well, I think he was about 74 or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a good long while. Yeah. So. But uh, he didn't make any fuss. I mean, I think he knew that it was inevitable that it had to happen. But it didn't stop him being manager. I don't think uh, the players knew just how serious it was going to be. And Mum and I went in to see him on the Friday night at the hospital and we could see that the leg was prepped for surgery the next morning. But um, Mum decided it was a home game here that day. Mum decided that we would keep it a secret until after the game was over. And then she told the chairman and I think he went down to the dressing room and told them what had happened. But uh, that was it. He did, uh, Mum felt that he would have been disappointed if the players knew in advance of the game, you know. Mr. Alec Miller was, uh, or Sandy Miller, was the orthopaedic surgeon at the Victoria who attended to the players here in Mr. Struth's time. And he had said to Mr. Struth, I'm afraid the leg's going to be, going to have to come off. I don't know how much of it. And uh, Mr. Struth turned and said to him, well, help yourself, Sandy. <laughs> that was it. And Mum and I went in the night after his operation and he was still very muzzy with the anaesthetic, but he kept saying to my mother, get the man about the boot, get the man about the boot. And my mother couldn't understand what the boot was, and it was meaning the, the fitter for the artificial leg, and it had only come off that morning. Mr. Struth's 34-year reign at Ibrox eventually came to an end in April 1954. He resigned and was replaced by Scott Simon. As illness took hold, he found he could no longer cope with his two-storey flat in Copeland Road. He sold up, as did the Dallas family, and in a remarkable show of devotion, moved in with Mr. Struth to care for him. Some of the former players would drop in and see him. That was nice. Uh -huh. And uh, I was driving by that time, and took him on holiday and mum and dad and I uh, up to Aberdeenshire and I think we visited Willie Thornton at that time, I think he was with Dundee, I'm not sure, uh, in Brotty Ferry and then the next year we went to Skelmerley at a hotel which had uh, rooms on the ground floor mm -hmm. and unfortunately he got pneumonia after that holiday and uh, died in, in his home. Mm. But what a funeral. Mm. I forget, I'll never forget the flowers in the back garden, mm. you know. Yeah. Reads from Celtic supporters and Celtic club and just everybody responded. The garden was full of reeds. It was lovely. On the 21st of September 1956, William Struth died at home in Glasgow, aged 81. Alex McLeish's Rangers side prepare for a friendly against Borussia Mönchengladbach. It's Saturday the 23rd of July 2005 and Mr Struth is finally ready to be unveiled to his waiting public. Today we are here to honour the late and great Phil Struth, one of our greatest ever managers, and to commemorate 50 years since his passing away. It's a fitting tribute to a man who even today is revered by our fans. And I'd now like to ask David Murray and Alison Muir 
to unveil the commemorative bust to Bill Struth. For decades to come, Mr Struth will sit proudly at the entrance to Ibrox Stadium, casting his eye over all who enter. Future generations of players and supporters alike will find themselves welcomed into the stadium by the legendary manager. A uh, perfect, good resemblance of him, because most the people won't remember him personally, they'll only remember him through the photographs and that, but it's really good, and that's the man he was. And I would say that uh, Bill Struth's legacy today, when they've uh, unveiled the, the bust in his honour, that uh, it's a fitting tribute to someone who, during his time at Rangers, made the club uh, renowned the world over in football circles. Uh, brilliant, brilliant, yeah. It definitely was uh, overdue, deserved, and uh, it left a younger generation know what kind of a person the man was. Wonderful. Mr. Rangers, I always called him anyway. He was uh, a hard act to follow. I felt quite emotional when I saw it. Uh, although I do have photographs and pictures of him at home, but to see the, the face, the, the normal size, brought back many memories to me. And I felt quite upset at it, actually. Not, not upset in a sad way, but I was delighted that eventually the thing is being done now. Absolutely thrilled. Um, it really is an amazing experience when you've taken the job through from the initial sketches into the clay and as you saw over the past few weeks uh, finally getting the likeness uh, as, like, as close to the great man as I could and then today when they pulled the cloth off it really was quite a good feeling. You know, It's, it's what makes these things special. It, was, it really was magic. 34 years as manager, the man best described as Mr Rangers finally back home where he belongs.